Thank you very much. And first of all, my thanks to uh, the organizers. And of course, uh, welcome to the ladies and gentlemen in the, in the room. My father pulled me near him and said, Kati, history is being written here. We were standing in the living room together watching the evening news. I was 10 years old, 1989. And it was the first time that I saw my father get emotional. The television showed a sea of young people laughing and jeering on top of a wall. One man was attacking the wall with a pickaxe. Others joined in, destroying the wall with whatever they could get their hands on. Loose panels in the wall were pushed back and forth until they fell over. People flooded through the walls. They held each other. They cried as history was being made. So did my father. This was his history too. My father had fled Hungary when he was 16 years old. One cold afternoon in 1956, after the crackdown of the revolution of 1956 in Hungary, leaves were turning orange and the village was preparing for winter. And he told his parents he was going to get some apples. Instead, he made his way to the border in Austria, crouched in the shops until nightfall came, and crawled under the wired boarded fence as fast as he could to escape the bullets that the border guards of his homeland were firing at him. He rarely told us about his flight, but this night, sitting in front of the TV, he pulled me close and said, do you see all those people? Do you see how they are embracing each other? Do you see how happy they are? I saw it. This, he said, is what freedom looks like. From now on, anything is possible. The Berlin Wall was a massive physical structure. Standing at 3.6 meters tall, it spanned 155 kilometers all around West Berlin. And the wall's 302 watchtowers and 20 bunkers had to prevent East German citizens from divesting, defecting to the West's freedom and prosperity. The Berlin Wall was also a massive structure in our minds. It served as the tangible representation of our separation, not just as a geographical or political entity, but as humans. We grew up separately. We lived our separate lives. We were over here, and they were over there. And things were supposed to stay that way. On 19 January 1989, just 10 months prior to this historic event that we are celebrating today, East German leader Erich Honecker predicted that the wall would still exist in 50 or even in 100 years if the reasons for it were not overcome. Yet gradually our interest in each other grew. We had been kept apart for too long. Now we wanted to know who was on the other side. And when the wall came tumbling down, Away for, due to revolutions in the East, we saw that what U.S. President John F. Kennedy had remarked in 1963 was, three, was true, that among the many traits citizens of the East and the West had in common, none was stronger than our mutual desire for peace. All of Europe, if not the entire world, was gripped by euphoria during the weeks and months after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Aussies and Wessies spent days talking to each other, laughing with each other, rejoicing in each other. And barely a month later, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and US President George W.H. Bush released a statement saying the Cold War was drawing to a close. The Velvet Resolution, Revolution in Czechoslovakia, the ouster of Romanian dicta dictator Ceausescu, and the Baltic states' democratic move towards independence during the following year sealed the fate of the Iron Curtain. Suddenly, the opportunity seemed limitless. Europe, long term into, was whole again. And if the unity of the people could defeat darkness itself, was there anything the people could not achieve? Today, my father's tears of joy over the fall of the Berlin Wall seem a distant memory. Leaders all over the world give preference to building walls over tearing them down. And some even take pride 
in making this construction of divisions into their rallying cry. Over the span of a mere 30 years, we went from 15 border barriers to 77. Together, they span 40,000 kilometers, exactly the circumference of the Earth. These walls could literally divide the world in two. And some would say that we lost. Europe's grand vision of democracy, liberalism, and the end of history that dominated the 90s has made, made way for pessimistic introspection. And that is not without reason. Far-right, anti-immigration, and Eurosceptic parties have surged in popularity across the European Union. Some member states have chosen to include these parties in their governments in the recent past. Other member states in the East are currently led by leaders that edge over closer towards authoritarianism. They erode the carefully constructed systems of checks and balances, curb judicial independence, police their civil service, and attempt to bring the media and civil society under state control. Corruption is endemic. New walls are erected to keep out refugees. And in the country of my parents, in Hungary, illiberalism has taken root. Despite this, the Prime Minister Viktor Orban still has the support of the majority of the people. And many regard these voters with bewilderment. Who are these people that seem to prefer autocracy to freedom? Why, despite these three decades of living like us, are they still so different? And why are they still building walls? Why are they not more like us? But this narrative of democracy giving way to autocracy of light giving way to darkness is careless at the very least. This way of thinking release, relieves us of our responsibility to reach out. And if we fail to even make an effort of understanding what drives these people, these same fiercely independent people that tore down the wall 30 years ago, we allow these walls to live on on our minds. The transition from socialism to capitalism was not easy. From the outset, the unification of Europe was not a unification of equals. The relatively poor, community-focused, introspective East was overwhelmed by the wealth and self-assuredness of the middle-class West. The GDR alone witnessed the privatization of thousands of firms over the span of a few years. And in the first half of the 1990s, Eastern states' GDP fell by 20 to 30 percent. Millions of people lost their jobs. The wages of those who remained never caught up. Unemployment rates soared. Many left for the West, leaving half-empty ghost towns behind. And this was not what people had expected from your reunification. They used to harbor great dreams of freedom and prosperity. And some leaders of newly independent states that found themselves in an economically vulnerable position responded by fostering a clear and exclusive national identity on which they alone were the guardians. This allowed citizens to be part of something greater than themselves, and it protected its leaders. Any attack on the leader was an attack on the entire population. Fear and vulnerability set the stage for the erosion of political freedoms. Governments brought courts under their supervision, aligned newspapers and other media outlets with their policies, and suppressed dissent. These autocrats were not alone. They rode a global wave of strongman rulers that proclaimed to put their country first, ramping up anti-immigrant rhetoric, while increasing social economic inequality, and in many cases, reaping substantial financial benefits. That is how they build new walls in their people's minds. And once these walls existed in people's minds, building physical walls was the easiest way for a government to demonstrate that they were actually undertaking action. 30 years after my father showed me the fall of the Berlin Wall on TV, 523 kilometers of Hungary's border are now sealed off by a wall. Those are the three types of walls what I see today. The old walls that we tore down, the new walls that we erected, and the walls in our minds that we need to overcome in order to truly unite. 
But wolves keep out the light. And it is this light that we need in order to, in the words of Willy Brandt, grow together, because we belong together. Doing so seems challenging in many ways. Today's escalation of global trade wars, rejection of multilateralism, and geopolitical antagonism between global and regional powers recently led even Gorbachev to remark that international politics is on an extremely dangerous trajectory. EU member states seem to be drifting apart with one of the union's most important members slated to exit within the coming few months. Will these new divisions tear us apart? Will the global system, under pressure from protectionism and polarization, finally implode and drag us all into chaos? No, it will not. And let me give you two reasons. The first reason is the people's deep-rooted and powerful resilience. This summer only witnessed again quiet revolutions when people throughout Eastern Euro Europe took to the streets to me demand greater transparency and an end to corruption and adherence to the rule of law. Protests from the Czech Republic to Slovakia, Romania were the largest again since 1989. And like in 89, it is the region's young people that are driving change. And the second reason is the growing awareness that the European Union truly needs all of its members. On the global stage, where great powers are redefining their approach to politics, the world needs reliable global powers to protect our achievements. And only collectively will our voice make an impact. We need to start by accepting that the old order is gone. We can no longer go it alone as individual states. Instead, we must provide a vision that reinvigorates the powerful idea of the European Union as a provider of peace and prosperity for all. We must create a long-term strategy fostering true unification. And we must support this strategy with our full political, institutional, and financial capacities. Our strategy needs to be based on a series of concrete actions in the interest of all concerned. We break down the intangible walls that divide us by reducing the inequality within and between our communities and states. We deepen our union by strengthening our institutions, sharing our social policies, and securing our neighbors. We protect our union by safeguarding our partnerships, the institutions of multilateralism, and our achievements in the areas of peace and security, underpinning these with economic and defensive capabilities. And we widen the inclusivity of our union by allowing states that fulfill the criteria to join. 63 years ago, my father dreamed of freedom. 30 years ago, part of his dream came true when the Berlin Wall came down. And today, it is up to us to tear down the walls in our minds. We belong together, and we will grow together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the speech. We have got time for uh, one question. Is there anyone who would like to? What would you have done otherwise after the fall of the uh, after the fall of the wall? What would you have done otherwise? A very good question, because only by answering, of course, that question, you know how to look ahead. I think, um, as a social democrat, I think we should have put more effort in in making sure that uh, also economically and socially we grow together. I think if you look now at the differences between states and among states, in very often the differences have only grown rather than shrank. And um, I think that is one of the underlying reasons why tensions are 
are, are being there. And the promise was always of a union growing closer together. And I think in many ways we have when it comes to values, when, the, when you look at overall economic figures. But for very many individuals in our societies, we have not been growing together. We have actually been growing further apart when you look at social economic reasons. So I think that is also the challenge for the coming years to make sure that also those differences are becoming smaller. Looking at 2004, the Big Bang of the European Union, when a country where I was born, where my parents are from, uh, joined the European Union, I think it was also a mistake, like it was a mistake in 89, thinking that this is where history ends. 2004, we also made the mistake thinking, now this is democracy, from here it can only get better. And we must, on a daily basis, also within our European Union, continue to highly invest in the rule of law, in building strong uh, institutions, but also on a democratic mindset, uh, because unfortunately history is not a linear process, where once it's going up, it's only going, um, going forward in a more positive trend. So I would say these are the two big lessons to be learned.